till finally in December of around Christmas time, I had a come to Jesus conversation, if you will, uh, and just kind of yelled out to God. I said, okay, God, if you want me to do this, because it was a lot of internal struggle with this, if you want me to do this, I'll do it. Hello, Alex. How are you doing? And welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to be here. I'm very excited to have you here because I just recently discovered you on YouTube and it was such a joy to discover you because I love your content. I love the way you interview as an interviewer myself. I feel like you're asking the questions I'm wondering about and you also have so many interesting guests. Guests, a lot of the same guests as I've had as well. And then like this Easter, for example, I was doing cross country, walking cross country, and I was listening to all these near death experiences um, with the people that you've interviewed. And it just feels so meaningful. It just, I mean, these topics to me are so important. And I just love that you're bringing so much content out, out there. And then I got curious, you know, what are your takeaways, you know, from all these interviews? What have you learned? How have you, how might these have changed your life? So today I would love to hear about that, like how you actually have built your YouTube channel and doing this work. And also, I know you are a filmmaker. You're so much more, mm -hmm. you're a podcaster, filmmaker, conscious entrepreneur, and you've been in the film industry for more than 20 years. Uh, and now you're doing, you know, a spiritual podcast. So I find that so fascinating. <laughs> So I'd love to actually start with, uh, before we go into your journey, do you feel like we're in a big shift right now? Do you feel like the souls who are living right now, you and me and everybody else, that we're actually experiencing something extraordinary, waking up more than a hundred years ago, for instance? Mm -hmm. Oh, with no question. Uh, we are definitely in a great awakening right now. There is more curiosity about these topics and about the deeper questions of life and the mysteries of life in the universe uh, than ever, ever before, because the conversations like this one we're having right now, or any of the conversations that you or I have on our shows, they would not have been around 20 years ago. Um, you know, if you said near-death experience, people were like, uh, this person's crazy. Or if you said channeling, which, by the way, people still think people who channel are a little nuts. And I always say that to the channelers when they come on my show. I'm like, this is insane. You know that, right? They're like, yeah, we know. But the ideas, the conversations would have never happened before. It's much more open now. People are actually looking for this. And what YouTube and podcasting has been is given people is they can do this privately now. They could publicly believe and say they believe in one thing. But privately, they can investigate and ask deeper questions, which might not go against their faith, what their family believes, what their community believes, what their profession believes. I have a lot of scientists who listen to my show, a lot of uh, quantum physicists, uh, neuroscientists, uh, brain surgeons. I've spoken to these people who, who, you know, in public, they can't say things like this because they would be mocked in that field. But now at the cocktail parties or in the dark corners of a party, they'll have these conversations, but now they can go deeper and deeper into these ideas uh, and, and curiosities in private. So I think, you know, based on my numbers of the people who are downloading my show, there is a, a rabid want and thirst for this information. And it doesn't seem like it's slowing down. And it's not just in the U S it's the world. I have a large audience around the world as well from, I mean, from places I can't even pronounce. Um, and I'm checking like, how did you find me? Like, how is like, how did that happen? So yes, to answer a long answer to your short question. Yes, we are absolutely in an awakening. No question. Yeah. To me, that uh, was really clear when I search for, out-of-body experiences and lucid dreaming like 15 years ago because I experienced that 
and I was searching online and I didn't find much about it. And now I just see it everywhere. Like every, I feel like everybody's speaking about out of body experiencing, lucid dreaming. Like you don't, your, your video is not going viral because you have lucid dreaming in the title, but that, that used to happen. Uh, I would love to hear about your journey because you're a filmmaker and that was your focus. And then all of a sudden you're doing a, a spiritual podcast. What happened there? So basically I've been a filmmaker for almost 30 years uh, and I've, I've done everything from direct feature films, worked with Oscar winners, uh, you know, just I've done everything you can do post-production editing, visual effects. I've done all of it. And uh, you know, I got, I got to a point where I owned my own post-production company where we did editing and color grading and VFX for features. And uh, I felt something was missing. So I decided to open up a podcast about filmmaking. Um, which is called Indie Film Hustle, which is still around and still number one in its space. Uh, and then soon after, I opened up a, another one for screenwriting, which is uh, bulletproof screenwriting. And I started to interview people and tell people the truth about the industry, trying to help people because uh, Hollywood's very shiny. Uh, and uh, as I say, they love, they're really great at selling the sizzle, not so much with the steak. Uh, so, and you know, a lot of people have a different perspective on Hollywood and I've been inside of it for so long that I was like, you know, people don't really understand what they're getting into. So I decided to open up this podcast and really tell people the truth. And within a few months, it was number one, and it's been staying there since uh, 2015 when I launched it. Then about two years ago, um, I had a friend of mine say, you need to open up a spiritual podcast. And I said, you're out of your mind. What? Because I've been closeted spiritual for a long time. I've been studying Yogananda. I've been studying yogic philosophies. I've been studying every type of religion and philosophy throughout my life, from Taoism to Buddhism to, to you know, um, Judaism. Obviously, I was raised Christian, raised Christian, so all of, I'm familiar with all of that as well. So I, I, I was always fascinated with the concepts of universe and, and quantum physics and it, all this stuff I've always learned on the side quietly and then occasionally when we're at a party would have a deep conversation but generally never publicly say anything so when this person told me you got to open up this show I was like why so like, it's time you need to do it I go all right I'll give it a shot what we'll see what happens and she I go when do you need me, when do you think I should do this she's like do it in three weeks I go you want me to launch an entire show in three weeks She's like, yeah, launch it up in three weeks. But I go, that's impossible. She's like, that's impossible for most people, Alex, but not for you. <laughs> because I have been doing this for so long, I have the skill sets to do it. So I did. And I launched it, built a website, got guests, built a logo, did it all in three weeks. And it was Easter because that's why it was the time clock. It was Easter of 2021. So I launched it. Uh, I had a few guests come in. I had um, some big guests show up magically like moby um and, you know the multi-platinum grammy seller and the lead singer of iron maiden showed up to talk about spirituality with me and his journey in life and I had a bunch of other people started to show up and then uh as if anyone knows my my work ethic i release a lot of content i was kind of scared so i was releasing one every other week so that tells you how scared I was of this because I didn't want to destroy what I'd built. I didn't want to think people, I didn't want people to think I was crazy. I didn't want to think people that, that I was, oh, he's lost his mind. He's a spiritual nut now. So I got, I pulled back. And then at the end of 2021, for the last three months, I stopped completely. I just stopped. I said, I, I, I you know what? I'm going to go work on this. I gave myself work to go do. I'm like, yeah, I'll go back to it. I'll come back to it. Till finally in December of around Christmas time, I had a come to Jesus conversation, if you will, uh, and just kind of yelled out to God. I said, okay, God, if you want me to do this, because it was a lot of internal struggle with this, if you want me to do this, I'll do it. I trust that you will guide me in the path that you want to guide me, and I am in your hands. And if I, I, I trust, I have faith that you will push me in the direction I need to go. So... I built a set, which is a set you see in front of you. I, I built a system. I did. I did. I took it all for real, and then started started going, and it went from one week to two a week, then from two a week to three a week, 
And then the end of last year, we started doing four a week and we still at still four a week. And within the year of 2022, we went from 800 subscribers to probably just uh, like 80 or 90,000. I think something like that, 70, 80,000, something like that in that first year on YouTube, which was a massive amount of growth. I've never seen anything like that before. Uh, and I've been on YouTube for since I have, since 05, I've been on YouTube with different channels. So I was, I was there before Google bought it. That's how old I am. So, uh, and then it's just taken off in a way that I can't explain. Um, it is grown to now we're getting millions of views a month and uh, you know, we're doing a lot of work. We're building it out a lot. We're going to be building out new channels coming out in the new year. We're translating everything into Spanish where that's going to be our first language expansion. Then we're going to go into probably either German or, or Portuguese and dubbed versions, not just, you know, translations. And we're going to continue to grow the message because at the end of the day, I'm a facilitator. And I want to get this information out to the masses. That is my job. That is why I'm here to do. And it's, it finally, I finally figured out that this is why I was, what I've been supposed to be doing all this time. I love filmmaking. I will make movies again. I think there's inevitable that there's a documentary or two in my future in this space. But, um, but all that training that I had of, media and working with celebrity and working with storytelling. I mean, I've interviewed the greatest story gurus in the world, every one of them multiple times. I learned so much about that process. It was all preparing me for this in my, in my opinion, I think it's all preparing me for this to the point where I could do a show like this. Cause it, it takes a lot of expertise and experience to kind of pull a show off this off. And, um, I just was kind of preparing for this all my life. And by the way, I was angry and bitter for a, many of those years in the film industry because I wasn't getting to the place where I wanted to go. And that's ego and that's a whole other conversation. But yes, I could keep talking. This is what I do for a living. So please stop. <laughs> <me>. <laughs> well, thank you for sharing. Uh, what I find a bit fascinating is that I identify with you a little bit because you come from an artistic background and I do too and I've felt sort of lost in it but I'm 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 not part of it still but sometimes I'm singing here and there and it's sort of part of me to be an artist uh, and you've been a filmmaker you know in that business I have been a much smaller business in Norway uh, but still you know it's that feeling of uh, being a I don't know, a show horse in a way. Mm -hmm. And uh, then going into a totally new direction and uh, being scared that people are are thinking you are crazy, especially when I started to speak about UFOs. I mean, people started laughing and uh, are you crazy? You know, do you really <laughs> believe that? Like, how can I, like there was even one woman who said, how can I take you seriously now? And... Uh, that hurt a bit. Like, what am I going to yeah. say to that? I mean, we believe in different things, right? But now as things are coming uh, forward, I'm like, oh, what did I say? <laughs> you know, like the, go the, the government said what? Right. Yeah. So, um, all right. So I know I, I just want to ask you have some favorite spiritual movies because I love that uh, part of Hollywood or the film industry is uh, focusing more on spirituality now uh what dreams may come for instance and yeah uh avatar i mean that could happen that could be on another planet that is like that so <clears throat> what are your spiritual your favorite spiritual movies my favorite spiritual movie of all time is groundhog's day all right groundhog's day is the most spiritual movie i've ever seen in my life and people are like it's a comedy i go it is an exact representation of the soul's journey. He lived multiple lives, thousands of lives. God knows how long he was in that loop at Groundhog's Day. But he starts off, how does he start off in the movie? Egocentric, all about sex, the physical, uh, eating anything he wants, money, all of that. After a while, he gets bored. Then he starts figuring, he's like, how am I going to get out of this loop, which is the karmic loop that we're all in? How do I get out of this? Then he starts to help people. Then he starts to educate himself. 
And he starts to get away from the materialistic and starts to go towards the spiritual in a funny, funny way, but continues to do so to the point where he figures out that the goal of life is not the physical or the materialistic, is to get back to source, to help people, to be of service, to find love, to connect with someone on a deeper level, which is Andy McDowell. So only when he gets to that point, he's released. That's a, that's the soul's journey. So that's one of my favorite films in, in that sense. It's, a, it's an unconventional spiritual movie. But if you look at it, and now a lot of people, when I say explain it like that, they go, oh, my God, you're absolutely right. It is a spiritual movie. Yeah, it makes so much sense. I mean, uh, and what a hell, you know, living the same day again and again. Uh yeah. You're so, literally, you're, yeah, you're literally in that. It's this, it's just a, he has multiple lives, but he just didn't change lives to other, other personalities. He just stayed the same and right. just continued, which is like, and, and that is a, a form of hell, essentially, just does the same day. At a certain point, he even says in the movie, he's like, maybe there is no God. Maybe he's just been around so long that he just knows everything. He said that in the movie. I was like, wow, that's a pretty deep conference. That's a pretty deep idea. I'm not saying that, of course, but it's just an interesting perspective. Because if you, you know, after a certain point, look, every one of us has a journey in this life. And we all have to go through trials and tribulations. But in this life, I don't have to deal with alcoholism or addiction. It's not one of the things I have to fight in this life. I have other journeys. I have other battles that I've had to deal with in my life, but that's not one of them. You know, I was, you know, born into a very loving family, didn't have an abusive family, you know, but there's other problems there too. You know, there's other situations that I had to, to challenge. So everyone travels, has these kind of different things that they have to accomplish in each of their lives. So in this life for me, these are not the things I have to accomplish. Why? Maybe because I've already done them. I've already accomplished them in another life. It's not the thing I need to deal with, you know? You know, I'm not a womanizer. I've never been something like that. I don't, I don't drink. I don't smoke. I don't do drugs. These are things I just don't do naturally, not from any moralistic standpoint. It is just something that just not occur to me. It doesn't feel right to me. Why? Because it's not the direction I need to go to in this life. But for others, very much so. That's why there's young, that's why, and be living in Hollywood for so long, you see it with these young artists, these young actors who all of a sudden have fame, worldwide fame. And what happens? Nine out of 10 times they're destroyed, mm -hmm. right? They can't handle it, but that's their challenge. And some get destroyed, rebuild themselves and come back out the other end. Some get destroyed and go down a deep part and that's the end of it. So it, these everyone has their has their challenges in this life. So that's a great analogy for that movie. That's why I love that movie so much. Yeah, and I believe that we all have a blueprint and a soul mission and several soul uh, themes as well uh, that we're here to learn. And if you have a very strong blueprint that you have a purpose, you know, to do what you're doing right now, it would be very difficult with having an alcohol problem and things like that. So I think sometimes that it's so specific and it's layered that way you've chosen your uh, parents, etc., to and uh, been born under the stars at an exact uh, specific time so that you got the influences you needed. And, you know, the universe is so amazing. Everything is mathematics. So I, mm -hmm. I think, you know, it's a really deep purpose to why it is like that for you. But then again, you have your challenges as well. So I, I feel like even though I heard the concept of like... Um, rest lives or like these lives oh where... uh, vaca vacation life a vacation, vacation life, lives yes. yeah i i still feel like you have some issues like there will always oh. be contrast because this uh this dimension is all about contrast so you cannot have no contrast <laughs> I think. right there's something you have to have something to do even if you have a vacation life right. time which i've heard about um, and then in the comments, I always like, I want one. Where do I sign up for the vacation? Yeah. Like Where you have money, you're either absolutely stunningly physically beautiful. Um, all these things that kind of just like, I'm just going to come down here and have a good time. 
And you're you know, always in a good mood, like you don't have you're any doubts. You're just like no always money. going. But there's always some. But there is something that you, there is a challenge to go through. But it in the circumstances might be a little bit different. Different in the physical realm this time right. around, you right? Because you know, being born extremely beautiful, like yourself and myself, but uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> we go through life differently. <laughs> no, I'm joking, guys. I'm joking. I'm joking. She is beautiful. I'm not. But you know, you go through you go through life differently than if you have a disfigurement or you have an abusive family, or you were born at the wrong time, the wrong color, in the wrong country, and the wrong religion. These are all different set of circumstances that really focus your life and where you want to go in this life. So yeah. And my experience is that a lot of people are actually drawn to spirituality because they're suffering. Like something has yes. happened, either they have met the wall or, you know, their spouses left them or they had a depression like myself or anxiety. So what is your story there? Is there a story on how you became or why you became spiritual? Oh, yeah. I wrote a book about it. So it, when I was 26 years old, I was given an opportunity to make a $20 million feature film. Uh, and I was a young man. I'd been directing for a few years, been doing commercials mostly. And uh, I was given this opportunity to make a $20 million movie. The only problem was it was with a mobster and a gangster. And he was a retired gangster, so he was rehabilitated. And uh, I I fell for it and got caught in the, the the web of the mob, essentially, for a year. And we try to make this movie and my life was threatened on a daily basis because he was like Joe Pesci from Goodfellas. And I had no, no skill set to deal with a, a personality like that at that point. I had no understanding of what I can or could not do. I wasn't trained that way. My family didn't teach me anything like that because it's just something that was not taught. So I was lost and defeated. But the weird thing is about that time period is I was that Hollywood took this man seriously. And I was flown out and I met the biggest movie stars in the world, billion dollar producers. I'm at, at the, at the Chateau Marmont in Hollywood at the Ivy having drinks with actors, uh, you know, it, you know, it, penthouses with billion dollar producers. It, it, it was the most surreal situation. So imagine being so close to your dream. Literally, I met Batman. There was one episode, one whole chapter about how I met Batman, the actor who played one of the actors who played Batman at the height of his power. And I went to his house and hung out with him. And I mean, he's literally inches away from me. Like my dream is inches away from me. And yet it didn't happen. And then I was kind of thrown afterwards, it just got kind of let go and thrown into the into the gutter, essentially. And I was in a depression for two or three years. I didn't pick up a camera. I didn't direct. I I hid in a garage sorting comic books and selling them on eBay with a friend of mine just to kind of deal with it. Uh, it was a devastating time until I finally got the courage to come back out. And that on a subconscious level changed everything for me because I'd always wanted to be of service to people. I think that was always something inside of me, but it was a, there was a drive now to help people subconsciously, completely subconsciously. So when I made my first movie, I, I was teaching people how I can, before anybody was teaching filmmaking, I was teaching people how to make movies at a low budget and was very successful doing it. And then my podcast was helping people. So that was, you know, seven, eight years of doing that. And then when I opened up my spiritual podcast, it just extended it to where it needs to be to this, this audience that I'm being, you know, I'm building right now, but it all spawned from that moment. And people always ask, would you change anything? I go, absolutely not. Because without, without the pain, without the obstacles, without the suffering, you learn nothing. That's why we're here. It's not pleasant at all. It sucks. But you learn more from losing than you do from winning. And that you need contrast in life. That's why we're here. Without that contrast, we cannot grow. So... Every painful thing that's ever happened to me, I would never change it because it is what has made me today. Without it, I wouldn't be who I am. I wouldn't be doing the work that I am doing. Hmm. So that is the kind of origin story of the gritty voice that 
people here on the podcast, Mike, sometimes, and that's my point of view and things. So I'm very ferocious in helping people on their path, first with filmmakers and writers and artists, and now in the spiritual space to try to get them to understand different points of view on life, different perspectives, to change their, not to change their ideas, but to be open to new ones that might spawn curiosities and investigation. Hmm. That's all it's about. Because if you believe you know everything, you really are not really getting it. In I've spoken to you as well, I've spoken to hundreds of spiritual masters, and everyone has a different perspective on the elephant. Everyone's looking at a different part of the elephant. And, it, and, and that's what I've learned. That's the biggest lesson I've learned from everybody. It's like everyone's looking, but the similarities are so profound. And that's the biggest lesson I've learned from what I do is that the stories keep, the people's conversations, the near-death experiences, channelers, spiritual masters, quantum physicists, ancient civilizations, whatever we're talking about, it all has common notes that I keep hearing again and again and again. I go, hmm, that seems, reincarnation seems like it's something that has been, everyone talks about it. And if for whatever reason, it rings true to me, it makes sense to me. That makes more sense to me than you only have one life. To me, one life makes no sense. You mean to tell me that you were born, you in Norway, you never get to experience anything else. I was born a Cuban guy in America at this time. I never get to experience anything else. That makes no sense to me. Like, it's like what pot luck? Some poor schmuck gets, you know, born without legs and, and then dies a year later and that's it? I'm like, eh, this doesn't make any sense. But being born again and again in the concept of evolution, that makes much more sense in a spiritual standpoint. So yeah, again, I could talk for hours. Please stop me. <laughs> no, I love <laughs> listening to you. <laughs> you know, there was this uh, guy, I think, that said that if you want wisdom, be careful because what you will receive is contrast. <laughs> and I remember I heard that many years ago and I was like, okay, I'm not going to ask for wisdom. I'm not going to ask for wisdom. <laughs> obviously, wisdom is experience and experience can be often dark things because, yeah, we grow, it seems like, very much from this contrast and difficult experiences. But I have also heard that you can grow through wonderful experiences. And I was so happy when I heard that in an interview that just remember, you can also grow like in a, a flourishing relationship. You don't need to meet all these narcissists and then learn about boundaries Like you can also uh, focus on having great experiences and learn through that. But uh, then again, I think uh, the contrast also needs to be there uh, to a degree. <laughs> but the, but, but yeah. let me, if I could jump in real quick, the lesson that you just said, something really interesting, you can learn from a loving relationship. You can. If you listen to the nudge of the universe when the lesson needs to be taught. If you're not listening when the lesson is taught, remember it starts with a whisper. Then it starts with a nudge. Then it starts with a poke. And sooner or later, you're going to get slapped across the head with a sledgehammer. And that's the, the, the lesson is just, and I've noticed that in my life. If I didn't listen to it first time, oh, okay, you didn't listen. Let's make it a little harder next time. Let's make it a little harder next time. Let's make it a little harder next time until until you, you're like, why am I in a relationship with this narcissist? And you're like, oh, because I got to learn this lesson. I got to get out of this relationship. And if I don't fight this and get out of it, this is going to keep happening to me. And, and it's so true. I don't know if it's in your life, but in my life, I've seen the same lessons, the same kind of people, the same kind of situations circle themselves years down the line. And I'm like, oh, see, I didn't learn the lesson. And they keep getting stronger and harder and more powerful to the point where you're like, you get sideswiped by a car one day and you're like, oh, okay. But it starts off as a nudge. It starts off as a little whisper. Hey, why don't you do that? And then when you do, oh, I don't want to listen to that right now. Okay. <laughs> yeah. And it's one of the hardest things because we have these blind spots in ourselves. Like I can see point. my friends and I can see, you know, others so well, but myself, it's just so hard to see it. And for other people, it's obvious. And I find that so interesting that there's just so many layers here that I'm not seeing clearly. 
Uh, mm -hmm. So yeah, it it can be really subtle, and that's why I, I I agree. I think the universe is really knocking hard on your door, and I think that it's the same with your soul's purpose. If you're not following your purpose and you're doing everything else and follow people's expectations and actually lying towards yourself, uh, which oh. you can notice in your body because your body will rebel, uh, then I mean all sorts of things can happen. Uh, that's my experience, because if you have set out to do something, uh, your soul has a contract with you and it's like, we're going to do this. And you go, you're doing that. So I need your attention. So I've experienced that <laughs> a lot in my life. And especially, you know, my depression was my biggest wake up call. Like I wasn't in contact with myself at all. It was just all about pleasing everybody else with my singing and I didn't know that oh, yeah. there was something called self-love, but I didn't have it. I didn't know what it was. So it has a, like it been a long journey for me. And I see that with my members and my membership. There's so many people with fatigue, especially like that's the new thing. So many people have fatigue and they're so, you know, drained physically. And I believe that is part of that is my theory. Uh, is that people are pushing down, uh, repressing energy. That is actually creativity, which is life force, that they're supposed to uh, express this, but they're instead, it's going the other way and becoming destructive. So we can't lie uh, for ourselves uh, because spirit will, yeah. Oh, no question. And a little tip that I found out is that when we're so caught up in our own drama and our own ego, that's when your blind spots are the worst because you're caught up in your own head where if you meditate and you start to bring more awareness to your inner power, your, your view on everything starts to widen and you start to see things that you didn't see before. It's happened to me in my life. So when you study these yogic masters or these spiritual masters, they get to a place where they could start seeing things at a different way and start seeing things within themselves and within other people because their viewpoint is so much wider. When, when you're stuck in ego, you're, you barely can see anything. You're covered in this mud. So of course, you're not going to see the blind, the blind spots. You're not going to see any of that stuff. But now you see that stuff coming from a mile away because your awareness has opened up a little bit more. But the more you go deeper inward to for, for, for information and for knowledge and for source, your viewpoint starts to grow and grow and grow. And that makes life a lot easier. That's why everyone says meditate, 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 meditate. Yeah. And that's why, you know, expand your consciousness. That expression doesn't mean anything or make sense before you actually start to expand your consciousness and see more perspectives to something. So have you had any spiritual experiences that you'd love to or like to share about? Well, I was having breakfast with Jesus yesterday and no, I'm joking. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, well, you had I an don't. experience with Jesus, didn't you? Like you, you pray to Jesus, and then uh, to it, either go for this or not, and you ended up going for the podcast. No, so my biggest, honestly, I'll tell you this: the biggest spiritual experience, one of the biggest ones I've ever had, is, is something similar. Where I was after that depression, I went to that depression. I almost went bankrupt, uh, and I was days away from signing the paperwork, like a day or two away from signing the paperwork to be bankrupt because I'd put myself into this deep debt. And I, you know, for many, many reasons, I was young and had no idea what I was doing. And this guy was, you know, it was just a, a rough situation. And I just said to the, I just called out to God and I just said, you know what, God, I, I want to pay my debts, but I have no job. I have no opportunity here. And if you don't help me, I'm going to sign these papers because I have to protect myself. I don't want to. I want to pay back my my creditors. I want to do the right thing, but I need your help. And I'll work, but you got to give me a shot. The next morning, I get a phone call from my first boss in the business. And he said, hey, I don't know if you're looking for work or not, but they're looking for an editor up north. Um, they know who you are already. Uh, I already told them about it. if you want to go, they're willing to see you. I went up there, showed them my demo reel, got the job, started getting paid. With a, within a month later, I got another freelance job. So I had two jobs all of a sudden. And I didn't sign the paperwork. And I paid everything off the way I was supposed to. And 
within a, I think within a year or so I was back on my feet. Then I opened up my, my own company and then the rest is history. But that was such a profound moment in life. I've discovered that most people don't ask for help, myself included. Don't ask for help. And the universe, your guides, angels, whatever you want to call them, will not interfere in your life unless you ask for help. That's such a big thing. You're like, oh, why me? Why me? Why me? Ask for help. If you ask for truly, honestly, ask for help, not the lottery ticket numbers, the true help. I need help. I need an opportunity. I need this. I need that. Uh, it, it, they do, it does happen. It happens almost all the time. I, at one point after, after years ago, I was by myself single. And I said to God in a very quiet way, I'm like, you know, it'd be really nice if I met someone who loved me and I could love her back. That was a simple, you know, request. Not even thinking too deeply about it. Three weeks later, I meet my wife. Oh, wow. And I had, and I had been single for years and we've been together <laughs> a long time. <laughs> so um, that literally, so those are the kind of things that happen. I don't have mystical experiences yet, you know, where, you know, I have um, things of my guests happen to my guests. Uh, that's not my path. But these kind of other experiences are pretty profound. So, you know, that come to Jesus, I call it the come to Jesus conversation, I'm just talking out to the God, to God, to universe, source, whatever, um, about the show. And it, this is where we're at, you know, and by the way, it didn't happen right away. I told you when I started, when I took it, started taking it seriously, it was six months before anything really, any hopes of something really happening. Cause it took the first six months I got to like 1500, but it's just low slog. And then it jumped to 3000 because I had one video that popped. Then it went back down. And then a few months later, but it wasn't like next month it was going, you have to do the work. And that's something that people get caught up in. They don't understand that giving control up, having faith in the universe that guides you in the way that you need to do and what you need to do in this life and your blueprint and so on is key. You have to, you have to let go of trying to control the outcome because we don't know what's best for us in many ways. If we would have had everything that we've ever wanted in life, what a horrible life that would have been. Can you imagine when you were a teenager? I just want to eat this all day. I just want to <laughs> date that person. I just want to do this. I, you would have destroyed yourself. You would have destroyed yourself because we didn't, we would, didn't know what we didn't know. So you're like, oh, I really just want to, I want to make a million dollars. But really the opportunity is to make 10 million in this new job or this new opportunity. But you couldn't see that. So you stopped it at a million, throwing that out as a number. Um, most people don't have these problems. Uh, <laughs> but but that's just an example of opportunities of what you want. You don't, you know, just let go of the control, for, let the universe guide your path. But you still need to come to work every day and do the work, cut the wood, carry the water. That is your job. So every day I show up, I do my interviews, and I, I can't control what happens to them. I can't control who sees them. You do that for sure. You've been doing it longer than I have. You show up, you do the work, and you hope for the best. And you put it out into the universe and let God, the universe, whatever, guide it to wherever it needs to be at that time. And that's all. But you have to get, you can't just wait for someone to knock on your door and go, Oh, here, here's some money. Oh, here's some opportunities. No, you've got to put yourself out there and do the work. But the key is to do the work without attachment to outcome. That's very difficult for the ego. Very difficult for the ego. But if you can do that truly, amazing things will happen to your life. I can promise you. Yeah, that is a deep one because, um, I mean, there is something positive, I feel like, in wanting something to grow. Uh, even sure. if money or views or whatever you're sure. doing that you want your channel to grow or you want to. You know? Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. I was there. I know it. <laughs> I've been doing it for most of my life. Yeah. So now you're not there. You're just surrendering like you're happy either or. I, I, 
Um, look, I, I surrender for the most part, but I, it's easier to surrender when the show is doing well. Right. <laughs> you know, when the show is not doing well and you're getting, you know, 50, 100, 200 people watch it, which was exactly where I started. There's a much deeper amount of faith that needs to happen there. So, but by the way, when I, when I, when I, when I signed up and said, okay, I'm going to take this seriously. I just did the work. I didn't have any expectations of it because I was like, I can't control it. So I'm just going to put it out there and put it out. And I just did the work and do the work and do the work and do the work. So I, it, it wasn't, it's a lot easier now, you know, when you're doing better and well, and we're getting a lot of people watching our show, but I was like that at the beginning. Now, did I want to get more views? Absolutely. <laughs> I want to get more views now. I want this. I want the messages of my guests to be, I want to get a billion views a month. You know, I want to get 10 billion views. I want everybody in the world to get exposed to these ideas to help the world. You know, not for any other, honestly, not for any other reason. And that's, and that's also another thing. I come from it from a place of service. I truly do. Yeah, that was my point because, you know, it can come from that ego part, but if there's fear in it, I would say it's ego driven, but it's, if it's more, no, I want to, I want to have views because I want to share this. I mean, this is a good conversation and it comes from this other place, right? Mm -hmm. So I want to jump over to uh, something different, NDEs, because you have a lot of interviews yeah. about NDEs on your channel, which I love. I have I sort of did a lot of them back in the days and now I come back to it. Uh, just my fascination for it has grown and come back again. Um what are the commonalities you see? Because I have some commonalities that I've seen from those I've interviewed. So what do you see is sort of the red thread of near-death experiences, which maybe can explain a little bit about what's happening on the other side, what can what <laughs> we will expect. So after doing, I think we've done probably about 50 or 60 of them at this point. Um, the common things, the biggest common things I, I see is that uh, they all are custom built for the person. So the person going, they're not all the same. They have common elements and I'll get to some of the common elements, but everyone goes through an, their near death experience is a custom design for them at the moment they're having it. So some people have life reviews, which is a common element where they review their life. Some people see the dark a dark a light at the end of the tunnel. Some people are in a void. Some people create a hell for themselves that they have to go through in order to be saved. That is another, we could de go deeper into that conversation because I'm fascinated about those as well. Um, some people have very pleasant, most people have very pleasant experiences, uh, but some have very negative ones. Very few though. I haven't seen a whole lot of them, but there's a reasoning why they go through negative ones. Some people have Jesus show up. Some people have Buddha show up. Some people have Krishna show up. It all depends. Some people have a third grade teacher show up. It, it, it really is very custom built. So that's the biggest thing. Um, the, the idea of the life review is a big thing. The uh, seeing people you recognize from the other side, your relatives, or having someone there that you feel like you've known forever but don't recognize, which could be a spirit guide, could be a, a relative, an ancestor of some sort that's been with you, but you just don't recognize them in this in this incarnation. Um, the common and every one of them, even the negative ones, because all the negative ones that I've spoken to at least eventually come out of the negative in the near death experience. They never go to hell and come back out of hell, wake up. That I haven't seen that yet. It might be there, but I haven't seen it yet or heard about it is the love, that the love is the frequency of the universe, that that unconditional, pure love is something that almost every single one of them feels. And it's intoxicating. They don't even understand it. I had someone explain it to me once. They're like, the reason why when you find, uh, when you have a child or when you have a loved one, uh, you're married to somebody and you look into their eyes and there's this feeling of love. You're tapping in a small percentage of what you feel. It is a connection at a deeper level than most uh, relationships. So you're connecting at a very soul level with that other person. And you're just 
scratching the surface of what the love is in the universe. So that's kind of that feeling. But those are those are some common elements. I mean, there's a ton from life reviews. Um, there's generally a, a, a point of no return where they get to a place and they can't, if they go past it, they can't come back. Uh, animals waiting for them, uh, green pastures, their pets and things like that. Green pastures, um, angels, uh, angels, oh, the council of elders uh, as well to kind of do a life review. Uh, sometimes there's no life review because they're too young. Sometimes they, they see, I mean, there's just so many, it's just so endless. They're fascinating to me too. I really never delved into near death experiences at all until the show. I was like, oh, this would be interesting. Let me talk to someone who had a near death experience. And then as I started getting deeper into it, I was like, this is pretty fascinating. And you start going deeper and deeper. And then you're like, wait a minute, this is opening up conversations. And then I started talking to like yogis in India about near death experiences. And they're like, yes, this makes sense. And this is boop, 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 boop. And this is why this happens. I'm like, oh, wait a minute. So the near death experiences are connected to the spiritual masters and to the Vedic texts, what they've been saying. Oh, and the Tibetan book of the dead or the book of the dead of the Egyptians. Oh, that's kind of like that. Boop. Okay. And you start, it's a big giant puzzle, this mystery of life. And you start to piece together certain elements of it. Near-death experiences are a very deep part of that, I, I feel, because it does show a lot of things. And people who say, oh, it's your brain in the chemicals and all that stuff. I've had people on the show who are brain dead, dead, clinically dead. There is no brain activity. Come back, you know, 20 minutes later, 40 minutes. I've had a guy come back an hour and a half later, two hours later. He was in a body bag. I and saw he came that back one. Out. Yeah, was he was wild. fascinating. Oh. Yeah, he he came back. So there's there's endless there's just so much with it, but I think it's a they're one of the keys to one of the puzzle pieces of this puzzle that we're trying to put together. I feel channelers are another one. I think channelers are fascinating. And I'm dear friends with many of them uh that I've known, some I've known for years. And you know, having these candid conversations off air sometimes at dinner or something like that, you, you, you just go, you know, people are like, Oh, it's fake or this or that. I'm like, I don't care what they, I don't care the messenger. What's the message. Don't look at the messenger. He does something weird. Or she does something weird. What are they saying? Does it ring true to you? Same thing with a near death experience. What are they saying? Is it helping you? Is it assisting you? Is it bringing you comfort? Is it, what is it doing? If it's doing that, use it. If it isn't, discard it and move on with your life. You don't need to leave a negative comment. Just relax. <laughs> it's fascinating because I have uh, a lot of the same uh, perspectives and experiences or uh, the thoughts about it uh, that especially, uh, and that was a big one for me as well, that oh my goodness, we're not all experiencing the same thing, that it seems like to be tailored for each individual soul. And what that explained me, it was very healing to me because then I felt very special. And then I realized everybody's special because in my depression, I just felt like I wasn't worth anything. Like I was not valuable at all. It was, that was like sort of the core of my depression, which is my bad self-esteem. And with people having different experiences I understood that well then God or the universe must love us so much that we get these this individual treatment that is like mind-blowing like it's almost like we have a universe each you know even though I mean I build, yeah. do believe we're all one and all that but and the funny thought is that well how can we know how the afterlife even looks like or is because we all have different experiences of it as well and then I was thinking about, you know, the Egyptian um, uh, culture, how they uh, prepared for death. Maybe that's the reason why they prepared so much, because they understood, like what you're saying, uh, what they thought or the beliefs they have right before they die or where they're at will affect their death. So maybe that's why they, you know, wanted to be really prepared for that transition, mm -hmm. which makes really sense now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, without, without question. I mean, 
I'd be fascinated because I, I actually interviewed somebody who studied indigenous near-death experiences around the world. And it was fascinating. I'm like, what do the Aborigines see? What do, you know, a tribesman in Africa see? What does, you know, a Norwegian see? Like, you know, what is like, what is, wherever they are, what, what, what are they seeing differently? Uh, it, American Indians, you know, and the native Indians here, what do they see? And it was fascinating to like, for the tribesmen, he said they saw instead of a tunnel of light, because they don't see tunnels, they don't know what a tunnel is because they, they're tribesmen. Nice. <laughs> they go, they go through a knot, a hole in, the, in a tree. And that's their interest to the light where uh, an Aborigine will see a path, a, a gravel path, and they will walk that path because also they don't, generally speaking, and these are all general terms about the, the indigenous, but they, it's just a different way of looking at it. So it was like, oh, that's pretty fascinating. So it's, you know, anyone who says, oh, it's just the brain at the, at, at the moment of death. I'm like, why is everyone so different then? Why are all these so different? There is some common elements, but there's some people who, who don't, you know? And if you want to go into the, 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 the negative ones, those are really fascinating to me. Yeah, to be honest, that has, uh, at one point, they really scared me. Uh, and I wanted to look into videos that I don't necessarily are drawn towards just to expand my mind uh, and to be brave uh, and uh, challenge myself a bit. So I watched these very religious near-death experiences with hell and Jesus and Satan and all that. And it actually frightened me because sure. the way uh, the people who had these experiences were talking was like, there's, you know, if you are not a believer, you will go to hell and you're lost forever. And I was like, Ugh. and even though I don't have that belief, uh, it just, they were so convincing in a way. And oh, yeah. the near-death experience was so convincing. And I was a bit desperate after that, watching those videos to like see another perspective, like, because I've been very um, occupied with getting the answer. Like that was why I started 10 years ago with interviews. Like I needed to find answers to what was going to happen to me after I died. It was a very personal thing. And then doing all these interviews, I realized I can never find the answer. <laughs> I just realized I'm getting more Only questions. one way. Only one way you can find the answer. It's, uh, it's you know, going. <laughs> oh, right. That's true. God is like, you have to wait. <laughs> just like everyone says, everybody wants to go to heaven, but just not right now. Yeah. <laughs> that makes sense. It does. No, so my understanding of negative negative uh, experiences, talking to near-death experiences who have negative ones, is that they, at least some of them, and some of them will come back with this fire and brimstone conversation, like they got saved, but it's really there's a hell and all that stuff, like you were saying. All right. Mm. It is based on their perspective and on their belief system. So this one lady who I had on, she actually created herself a hell that she said that she had to go through because she believed in hell. So part of her customized near-death experience is to walk through hell and to deal with demons in hell and all this stuff. And then eventually she was saved by a light, by Jesus, by an angel, by something like that. And But I've seen that again and again, that they they had those beliefs going in. It's not like you see a, a, all of a sudden you have a, a Hindu and he goes in and has a hell experience because hell is not a concept in Hinduism. So it's generally not that. Though Jesus might show up in a Hindu's uh, in a Hindu's near-death experience because they know of Jesus um, or something along those lines. I've had, I just, I, I just interviewed somebody who saw Shiva as a child. She was eight and she saw Shiva and she had no idea who Shiva was. None, never seen Shiva, but Shiva showed up, but she felt very comfortable with Shiva um, because it was both the destroyer and the, and the mother, the, the, the both energies. And she told me later that she's like, it must've been that I, in another life must have been Hindu and knew that for an eight year old, that image would be comforting to me at a deeper soul level. Yeah. I know you're making you think now, but then she didn't even know who Shiva was until years later when someone, she was telling to somebody, he's like, well, that's Shiva. 
who's Shiva? And she had to look it up. And she's like, oh yeah, that's Shiva. You know, and, and same thing for Jesus. Like she, Jesus showed up in her first, she had two near-death experiences. Or, I mean, that's a that near-death experience is mind-blowing. I can't wait for it to be released. It hasn't been released yet. But um, her, her first one was Jesus. And she knew of Jesus because she was raised in America. So in America, Jesus is, people know who he is. But she wasn't religious. She wasn't anything. And he showed up to help her. So it, it's, it is a fascinating conversation. And you know what? At the end of the day, even if they're all just stories, if they all made up, let's say everyone's making them up. I don't believe that. If it brings peace to someone who's about to die, what harm is that? Do you know what I mean? Like, if I'm up on my deathbed and I've heard these stories, and you know what? It makes me feel better going to the other side. Why not? What's the harm in it? I would rather give someone peace at the end than fear and, and desperation. You know, so these 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 stories have a place, and there's a reason why they are so um, healing for so many people who either are on the brink of dying or they've lost somebody close to them, younger or a kid or a relative or a brother or sister or a husband, whatever, and it makes them feel better about what's happening. It's a it's a part of the the trauma relief, if in a sense, because you said okay. And you hear these stories, and I'll tell you from interviewing, I'm sure you say the same thing, from interviewing them, people are like, oh, it's just about they're trying to sell a book or they're trying to make money with it. And I'm like, these people are putting themselves out in a big, big way. And I promise you, if anyone who's ever been in publishing understands, you don't make money with books, generally speaking. And you're definitely not going to be making, unless your last name is King or Rowling, uh, you're not going to be making huge amounts of money on books especially in near-death experience books, for God's sakes. It is something that they're called to do, and it's something that they want to do. They want to share their experiences. And some of them have held on to it for 20 or 30 years. Yeah. So yeah. it's a pretty powerful I, thing. It's so powerful. And I'm just thinking with that young girl, that since she was young, maybe she was even tapping more into her past life, uh, that it's different for a young girl who's dying than uh, a woman or a man who's old because then we have so many new beliefs that we have like sort of lost the grip of the past life. But that makes sense to me why she saw Shiva because she was so young and she maybe connected more with her past life. And also in the, while they were, while she was, because she was eight, they spoke in two or three word sentences, very clear, very it, it was very simple because it was custom built for her. Oh. He didn't have a large conversation with her right. about words that she wouldn't understand at that place in her evolution in this in incarnation. So it was fascinating to see because I love hearing the young, like really young near death. Not I love hearing it, but when I hear a near death experience of a young person, usually told by an adult, which is generally the way it works, and that's all I've ever had. It's fascinating to see how a young person, she had no life review. She was eight. Right. There's no, there's no life review. Um, I've talked to uh, an ex, uh, what is she's um, um, PMH water. Uh, yeah, she's, I've interviewed her too. Yeah. She's like 7,000 children NDEs and, and having a conversation with her about that and what they're all common and things like that. But it's fascinating. There's animals generally in them. There's uh, animal faces, even like Jesus is in this, in this, in this person, Jesus's face turns into a lion uh, and then helps her get to the other back, back to, to life and things like that. But these are all custom built things for the individual person. Yeah, it's beautiful. And it's just so multidimensional and it mind-blowing like in those life reviews what i've heard is that you can hear or see every perspective like not just feel. yeah feel or you like if i'm speaking to you now i would feel your perspective of me and experience every single moment i've lived i mean that's amazing how is that possible and i'm just waiting for the films to come out uh 
about this. So when is that film going to be made, uh, Alex? <laughs> I'm working on it. I'm working on it. I'm working on it. Give me a few more years. I gotta I gotta build this YouTube channel up. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but no, it is it is I think that there definitely is something like that in my future. I'll probably do something. I don't know what, I don't know what topic, but it's something that needs to be discussed at a much deeper level to get into a wider audience. Like what Graham Hancock did on Netflix with his Ancient Civilizations series that started yes. throwing ideas out into the world about our our origins our true origins what the history what the not what the the evidence is saying so many people around the world are now curious asking the questions what is like when were the pyramids built how were they really built did we this we didn't start 6000 years ago that makes no sense well why is this thing 12000 years old and they just discovered it and wait a minute, they're finding things from 30 or 40,000 years old. I'm like, you mean Antarctica wasn't always frozen? So that are they finding pyramids up there now? Like there's so much stuff. And it's just an example of ideas being thrown out into the masses. And when you get it out into the masses, it, it starts to change things. It starts to change perspectives. Just like meditation, yoga, which is now a common thing. There are apps, for God's sakes, on those things. Before you were looked at like in the 70s, 60s and 70s, you were a hippie. You were a weirdo to even talk about meditation where now there's scientific uh, proof of its benefits. If it's not spiritual, just the physiological benefits of meditation and yoga, then you could tap into the spiritual stuff and what it does there. It's a whole other conversation. But there is these kind of things that were once taboo. Hell, this conversation, you and I will both have been burned at the stake. Uh, you know, at least me <laughs> a couple of hundred years ago, <laughs> <laughs> you know, we would have been burned. Maybe I have been, you know, <laughs> maybe we both have been at yeah. one point or another, but the thing is that now we can have these conversations very openly because of technology, because of yeah. things like YouTube and podcasts and things. And people like you and across the world are listening to me and people across the world are listening to you it's unheard of and it's only going to get bigger and bigger and bigger. And as, as this information continues to grow and grow and be put out into the masses, uh, I think it's going to change the world. I think to awaken the world, you need to awaken yourself. And the second you awaken yourself, you inspire people around you to awaken and it becomes a chain reaction. You can't change the world. You can change yourself. And if you do that, everything else will start to work itself around you. I promise you, it's happened to me. People around me have changed. This show has changed me in a way that I can't even express how much interviewing these people. I'm sure you're the same. When you talk to so many of these near-death experiencers, channelers, quantum physicists, spiritual masters, you change because you're having deep, deep, deep conversations. And on a selfish standpoint, you and I get to ask whatever questions we want. I know. <laughs> that's why I do this. I'm so curious. <laughs> and that's what makes a good show is that curiosity because I'm not asking questions as a journalist and neither are you. We just truly want to know. So how were the pyramids built? <laughs> yeah. Reincarnation. How does that really work? You know, are we living in a simulated reality? Is this like the matrix? Like what are we, you know, and is, is, from a quantum physicist and a spiritual guru answering the same question? Fascinating fascinating stuff i'm very grateful for be doing i have the possibility to be doing what i'm doing and i'm sure you are as well and there's so many people who are so grateful for you alex so thank you so much for you know doing all of your beautiful work uh, and uh creating so many videos you're creating an insane <laughs> amount of content uh i'm like ah oh. Yeah, uh, I really look up to you. I got to get oh, more videos out there. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank I'm you nuts. So don't, under, yeah. I'm insane. I am insane. Understand that. So don't try to do, I'm, in, I'm loco in la cabeza, as they say in my language. Yeah. I'm nuts. But it's passion. I'm passionate yeah, about what I'm doing. Yeah. And I want, I need to get this out there. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for this beautiful conversation. And uh, yeah, all the best with your work and your channel. Thank you so much for and thank you so much for the work that you're doing in the world, helping people awaken around the world. You, you've been doing it longer than I have. So, thank you, my dear. I appreciate you. Thank you, and thank you for watching, everybody. Much light from the U.S. and Norway. Bye bye.